Hi and welcome to Click to Infusion 2.5 for beginners. Uh, this is episode 3 um, and we're actually going to have a look at quite advanced topic today uh, considering it's only the third episode. What I'm really keen on not doing is dragging out the basics and not doing anything at all uh, advanced. Um, when I say this is advanced it is really necessary that you understand these topics early on so you don't end up having to do um, really uh, laborious, boring uh, code that actually these things we're looking at today can save you a heck of a lot of time. The key to programming, especially in the early days, was to keep the code as small as possible. The smaller the code, the quicker it was, the easier it was to dis distribute. Um, back in the days of the floppy disk, there was not very much of 26 megabytes or whatever it was, um, space to put your game onto. Before those days there was even less. Um, so even nowadays on mobile phones especially it's really important to keep your code as small as possible. In fact a lot of the coding process involves writing an amazing program and then spending weeks, months, even sometimes years cutting it all the way down. It's the way that even Xbox and PlayStation games are created is they end up making a game that's way too big to even put on a Blu-ray disc or, or whatever they use to distribute it. Uh, a lot of the ways around that that they've used is they end up downloading more content and updates uh, at a later stage via the internet onto the user's Xbox or PlayStation or Wii, for instance. Um, so we're looking at uh, understanding these concepts straight away. It's much easier to do these as you as you uh, write your code rather than going back and thinking, oh, well, I could have done done it this way. The game we're looking at doing today is a simple memory recall game. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, there's going to be tiles, and some will light up in a random order, and then you've got to repeat the the order which um, that they they light up in. Um, the two concepts we're looking at using are loops and alter alterable values. Now, every time I say that word, I will probably repeat it several times with different pronunciations. Alterable values. I'm going to try and get that straight away. So the project is going to involve us generating a tile grid using loops. Um, so it's uh, straight away we're using loops for this project. Then I want to store the position uh, data somehow in the tiles using alterable values. Uh, create a pattern on the screen so they will light up in a random order. And then user must repeat the pattern otherwise they lose. And then game repeats with longer patterns to remember. So there might be three to remember and then four and then five. And so the, the game gets harder. And it's really important when you make games that you make them uh, harder as you progress or more interesting or different things happen, different levels, don't just make it the same thing again and again uh, unless there's uh, some sort of uh, element of difficulty increasing or something changing throughout. Okay, so that's the game that I want to create. So I'm going to start clicking Infusion up and File, New and this is uh, the uh, storyboard editor so I want to double click on this to get the frame editor and like we've t discussed in um, episode 2 this is our level here, we, they call it a frame in click to infusion every programming language calls it a different thing and I want to start off straight away by creating an active now first thing I'm going to do is like I did in episode 2 click and drag uh, using the select tool and click delete to remove what's there make it a bit bigger to easier to see and I'm going to use the fill bucket and fill it with maybe you know, a more neutral colour sort of purple and what I'm going to do is uh, put a couple of stripes along it and click OK now that tile at the moment is not going to be big enough. Uh, what I don't want there to be is hundreds of tiles and it makes the game a lot more difficult um, for the user straight away. So I want to increase the size of that and actually that gives me uh, a unique way of showing you something I discussed in episode 2 but didn't show you directly. If I double click that and I want to resize it 
and I want it to be about 100 big. These three, uh, we talked about these two uh, in the episode two, but I want to talk about this third one. So we know proportional keeps these uh, in the same ratio. So at the moment, uh, they're the same, 32 and 32. So if I change that to 100, it will instantly change that to 100. The stretch, we know, makes sure that this becomes 100 big. If I click Apply now, all it's done, and I click OK, all it's done is made the object 100 big. This object, which was 32 uh, wide and 32 big, remains the same size. So if I click Ctrl and Z, undo that. This time click Stretch. Now, if I don't click Resample and apply that, Click OK. I'm just going to go to View and Zoom 400. You can see that the object is jagged edges. Now, this might be the effect you're after, especially if you're after sort of retro graphics from the early console days. If I zoom out and I right click, uh, sorry, I Control and Z, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone the object and I'm going to apply this as I did before and double click this one. This time I'm going to click resample. And I'm going to just have them side by side. Zoom in again. Zoom 400. And with this you can see the difference. The one on the right, the resample thing, basically does something called anti-aliasing. And anti-aliasing says, well, if you make something bigger, instead of just keeping the boundaries exactly the same as they were, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to show you on this, is guess the colour that it would have been had you have drawn it at the 100 by 100 straight away. And what it does is instead of the jagged edges, it looks at the two colours on the boundary and picks colours that are sort of halfway in between and creates this sort of blur effect so it doesn't look like it's been enlarged. It looks like maybe, in some ways, it's always been like that. Now, both effects have their benefits. If you want to go for a sort of more retro effect, then that works very well. The benefit of this one is if you create a character and create him really small, and then use anti-aliasing when you increase it, you can get some nice shades that you wouldn't have got otherwise. Um, so it's good to experiment with both of those. Now this video today is not on anti-aliasing. I'm going to pick the one on the right, there, delete that one, and I'm going to use this one, and I'm going to name this Tile, not the most original name. Something else which we haven't discussed is action points. When I'm using uh, Click to Infusion to create the um, stage and to, to sorry to create the position of each of the objects on the screen, I need a point at which to, to describe where that object is. Now, if I double click on this, and I'm going to zoom out just slightly now, and click on Hotspot, which is what Click to Infusion call it, Hotspot. You can see that it's all the way up here. Now, you might think, well, why has it picked that point there to describe where the position is? Well, there's two reasons. The first reason is Click Team automatically picks the middle of the object, absolute dead center of the object. It didn't used to, it used to pick the top left, but now it's decided that the middle is better for platform games and, and other things. And I, I would agree with them that the middle is more obvious to pick so that was a good decision for me and most of my programs and uh, games and applications I always move it to the top left I find it a lot easier to know where it is if it's in the top left but it's 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 up to you I mean you could pick the bottom right for all of your objects or you could mix and match now you might think well that's not the middle of the object well it was the middle of the object before we increase the size of it it was 32 by 32, which would have made the middle of the object be 15 by 15, because obviously the uh, coordinates start at zero. Now what I want it to do is make it at the top left. Now you might think that the x at the top left is zero. Correct. 
and the y would be, well, it would be 100, because as you all know from maths at school, the coordinate starts, uh, the y coordinate starts at the bottom. Incorrect. This is something else about programming languages. Most of them, not all, but most of them pick the top left as your origin, not the bottom left. So you've just got to remember that to get the y coordinate here, to get the action point here, it's going to be zero because that's where the origin is. So if you think about a website, you don't know how tall the website is. It could scroll down for a while, but you do know where it starts. It always starts at the top. So picking the y coordinate zero at the top is a heck of a lot easier than working out the height of it and working out where the y has to be. So generally it's easier working downwards rather than upwards. There are different reasons for why the y is picked uh, zero at the top. Um, but I'm not going to go into them too much. I just think of it as a website much easier. And it does make things a lot easier when you're uh, creating websites with HTML and CSS and JavaScript and all of that. Okay, so we've put the uh, hotspot at the top left. So that's fine. So I'm going to position this at the top left. Now, it's very difficult to get it exact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the second one here and just do the X and the Y. Now, one tile is great, but I want more than one tile because the game is uh, multiple tiles and one at random lighting up. So if I click on application and click on the second one, and I can see that by default it's 640 by 480. So I can fit, because there are 100 each, I can fit six of these across and four of them going down. So if I right click this and I'm going to duplicate, which means I'm going to do the same object and I'm going to have, let's have a thing, rows it across, so I want four of those because only four of them will fit, and I'm going to have six columns. And there we go. Perfect, almost. Now it's tempting to think, well, okay, I, I want some way of dividing these because at the moment they're sort of blending into one. So if I double click on one of them and go to this rectangle tool, and I'm going to make the rectangle quite fat so I can see it, click on black and this is the difficult bit here I want to get it so that it's all, oh, pr pretty much perfect I believe that is and click OK what do you think is going to happen when I click OK well instead of them being divided by 5 they're divided by 10 because there's 5 pixel border on this tile and 5 pixel border on the left hand side of this tile so making 10 so you get a quite a thin, nice thin border around the outside, and then these fat borders in the middle. So, so let's undo that. So all I'm going to do is click on the frame and click Control and Z. We could do it with the edit and undo. So you might think, okay, well, let's have a think. Let's do two lines. One at the left hand side. And one at the right hand side, uh, one at the top, and I'm not, I think that's four. But let's let's just try that out, and that looks a lot better. But the problem is that at the bottom you don't have a border, and the right hand side you don't have a border. So I'm going to press Control and Z again, and Control and Z a second time, and we'll start off with just my block here. Now I'm going to do something that actually is a better way of doing it. I'm going to position this at 0.55. I'm going to right click on this, duplicate, and again I'm going to do my four rows and six columns, but I'm going to leave a little gap between each one. And uh, then, so it's at 55, and that's 110, so that's perfect. Then I'm going to click frame and click on the background color, black. If you look now, that's created a perfect border around these by just not putting them next to each other. So that's the effect I'm going to be after during this game. But my problem is that each of those objects are identical. So there's no way of telling them apart. And that is a big problem. Because if you can't tell them apart, how do you know which one to light up? How do you know which one the user clicked on? So I'm going to undo that. 
And this brings us on to loops. Loops allow you not only to keep doing the same thing, but they also allow you to change the thing you do slightly for each loop. And we're going to go into how to do that in a second. So all a loop is, is a repeating bit of code. All right, and that's really important that you know that because loops are really important to all programming languages. There isn't a programming language, and someone will comment and go, oh yeah, there is, a really old one. There isn't a modern programming language that doesn't use loops. They all do. It's a, it's a part of any programming language, and this is why it's really important that we understand how they work. So what I want to do is create a loop that automatically creates these objects going across and I also want to use the alterable values to put a bit of data on each of those individual objects to tell them well, where they are. So that when it when the loop creates each one, it says, oh, well, you're at X position 1, you're at X position 2, X position 3, X position 4, 5 and 6. And we also wanted to say, oh, well, you're at Y position 1, you're at Y position 2, you're at Y position 3. Now, something I've said actually isn't quite how it works. I called this X position 1, and you need to get that out of your head straight away. It's not X position 1. Most programming languages and most objects in ClickTeam and most things in ClickTeam start at 0. And it's the really, really important that you remember that. Even now, after using ClickTeam and using Multimedia Fusion, using Click and Play, using all of those programs, and coding using other programming languages, I still forget. First is one. You're, you're ingrained in school that the first one is one. I mean, the, the word first, if you write it, has a one in it. But in programming languages, the first is zero, and you've really got to get your head around that. So that would be x is zero, x is one, x is two, x is three, etc. y is zero, y is one, y is two, etc. So I'm going to get that out of the way now. The, the numbers start at zero with ClickTeam, and there are exceptions. Most of the exceptions, not all, but most of them, you can change and edit to say, well, actually, I don't want it to start at one. I want everything to start at zero. There are a few objects like the string parser and a few others that you can't change, that they, they automatically start at one. But most things in ClickTeam Fusion start with zero. So, okay, that's a little bit off topic, but it's really important for maybe later videos when we do objects like the list object, for instance, uh, that you can choose between. So we want to set up a loop to create all of these tiles, but the way we're going to do it is not by having one loop that, that decides them all, and you could do it that way. We're going to create two loops, one loop to choose and to create the X's, and one loop to then create the Y's as well. So we're going to have a loop that starts here and then creates all the Y's, then shifts along to here, then creates all the Y's here, then shifts along here, creates all the Y's here, etc, etc. Okay? And we're going to just do the X's first, but that's what we're going to end up doing. So I'm going to click my event editor, and I'm going to go say, well, at the start of the frame, oh, start a frame, and I want to start a loop, fast loop, start loop, and that's our way of doing it. So you click the first one here, special conditions, fast loop, start the loop. And I'm going to say create tiles, because that's what we want to do. Highlight that and copy and get in the habit of that, because you'll always need it. Now, I'm going to do something unusual here. I'm just going to do one loop. reason for that is I might want to create tiles later on. So instead of having to do all of this again, I can just fire the create tiles loop. Now I need an object to cap I need an event to capture that loop. So I'm going to create a new event and say on loop. On loop create tiles. So at the start of the frame it says, oh I need to start the loop create tiles. It looks down your code and when it looks down your code it always starts at the top and works its way down. And it says on loop create tiles. Go, ah this is the one I want to start. And on this, I want it to start straight away, fast loop, start loop, and I want it to do the X's first. So I'm going to use the same tile, same uh, names, but just put an X at the end of it. 
again, copy that. Now, how many X's do I want? Well, I wanted six going across, so I wanted six X's, so I'm going to do that six times. Instead of right clicking and going on loop, what you can do is just drag this and just copy this down, and then double click it and paste in the new one with the X at the end. Now, I'm not going to do the Y's straight away because I want to show you how just to do the X's. Now, what I want to do is create the tile and then position it. So if I right click on create, create object, tile, it doesn't matter where I put this. Some people will put it off the screen. Uh, I always pick zero, zero, um, but it might be better to put it off the screen so that you don't get these random jumps if you have a bigger application. And so it's created the object, but I don't want it to be at zero, zero. So I'm gonna right click here, and I'm gonna say the position. So I'm going to set the X coordinate at 5 for now. And I'm going to set the Y coordinate at 5. Now you think, you're thinking probably, why didn't I just create it at 0.55? It's because eventually, or in a second, I want to actually put a bit of code in there, which I'm going to describe to you in shortly, to shift it at different amount each time so the X and the Y position won't always be the same. So if I run this now, we we'll just have that there, but if I want to do is drag that off, and I don't want that to be created at the start, so if I click the third, uh, sorry, fourth tab and deselect create at start, then that won't be created at the start of the application. And let's run it again, and there we are. That's the one that's being created in the loop. Now it's been created six times, so there's actually six objects there. You can't see it, but there are six objects there. So let's close that. So it's firing off six times. One, two, three, four, five, six. But I've said that each loop doesn't have to be the same. So how do you make sure that the second loop and the third loop aren't just doing the same thing? You do that by using the loop index. When you fire off a loop, the loop index starts at, you guessed it, zero. So the loop index for create tiles x will be zero. Then when it fires off again, it'll be one, then two, then three, then four, and then five. It stops at five because I've fired it off six times and we're including the zero as well. So the zero as well makes six, okay? So I can use that number to make sure that the X position is not going to be in the same position. So if I right click on this, edit, I don't want the X position to always be five. I want some way of shifting it across. So if I do a plus, I'm just going to open a bracket as well. And if I right click on the special, go to fast loops and get that loop index and paste it in, because it should still be copied. So on the first loop, this will return zero. On the second loop, this will return one, then two, then three, then four, then five. But position X coordinate five, then six, then seven, then eight, then nine, then 10, it, you're not gonna see it. They're, they're not shifting enough across. So I wanna do a bit of maths here. And what I'm going to do is times this by 100 and close the bracket. And what that will do is, let's do the maths on it. When the loop index is 0, which is at the start, 0 times 100 is 0, plus 5 is 5. Well, I wanted the first one to be at x coordinate 5. On the second loop, the loop index will be 1. 1 times 100 is 100. 5 plus 100 is 105. So that will put it right next to it. And then the next one, 2 times 100, 200 plus 5, 205. That will put it next to the second one. And that will look nice. But what I'm not doing is I'm not putting the little gap in between each one. So instead of 100, I want 105. Let's click OK. And let's run that. Run application. Perfect. And that's exactly what we wanted. But what we want to do is, on this loop here, on this first loop of create tiles x, I don't want it just to create one, I want it also to create the other y ones. 
and then on the second loop I want it to create the Y ones. So what I can do is instead of doing the creation here, I can let the create tile X fire off another fast loop. So start loop. I'm going to paste in the other one, but I'm going to change that to a Y. This time I wanted four uh, rows, so I'm going to do four. Click OK. Then I'm going to do the same. I click and drag this down. And I'm going to change that to a Y. Now I'm going to do something deliberately wrong here, but it's to show you something else in Click Team Fusion. I'm going to drag these down which you wouldn't think would be wrong. And I don't actually know what's going to happen, but I predict it's not going to be what I wanted. Run application, and no, it's not what I wanted. That shouldn't happen. It shouldn't end up with two tiles. I don't know how it's picked two, I don't know, but it shouldn't end up with two tiles. What's happened is that it has created the object after it's positioned them. Now, Click Team Fusion is a computer. Uh, well, it's built on the programming language which is compiled and understood by a computer. Computers don't have brains. They don't think, oh, this is probably what you meant. Unless you're using a programming language that has intelligence, which hasn't been created yet, it will do exactly what it's told to do. It's been told to position them before it creates them. Well, what's, what's it, what are you telling it to position? It doesn't know. It has no idea. So it picks all of the tiles and positions all of them because you haven't told it any different. Click Team Fusion is very, very clever at understanding that if you create something and then position it, it's only that thing you've created that you want to position. But if you do it the wrong way around, it's not going to have a clue and it's just going to position all of them. It, it assumes that's what you want. Now we've talked about the um, storyboard editor, which is the startup screen, the frame editor, and the event editor, but we haven't talked about the event list ed uh, editor. The event list editor allows you to manipulate what order things happen in just one row. So if I double click on this, and I can double click either of these events, that's the order at which Click to Infusion's running. It's positioned the X, then the Y, and then it's creating it. Now, we didn't want that. So if I click and drag this to the top, and then run, and that's exactly what we'd expect. Each of those are four blocks, because the Y loop is happening four times. But that's what we'd expect, because we haven't programmed that yet. So let's program that now. So instead of Y position 5, I want to do exactly the same thing to the Y position. Oh, I've got to choose fast loop first. So fast loop, get loop index of the Y this time. Times that by 105. And let's run that now. That's perfect. That's what we'd expect. So be very careful that you've got the positions of them correct uh, in the event list editor. Just double check that you're doing things in the correct order. Now, I've said that the whole basis of this is that we have a little bit of code attached to each of those tiles, and that's what we use alterable values for. But how do we assign those bits of code? Well, I've also said that Click Team, when you create something, it assumes that anything else on that line is talking about the thing you've just created. And it's really important that you do things when you create them, as soon as you create them, that you do anything you want to happen to that object on the same line. If you do it later on, Click Team Fusion won't have a clue which object you want to do it on. So, on the same line, as well as choosing the X and Y position, we're going to attach the position of each of the object in an alterable value. So, I'm going to right click here, and go to alterable value, set, and you can see there's an alterable value for every letter of the alphabet. Now, I could pick A and B, but I'm not. I'm going to pick X and Y just to make it a bit easier for me to remember. And I'm going to grab the loop index for the X and put it in the alterable value of X. And I'm going to do the same thing with the Y position. Fast loop, get loop index, and I'm going to grab the Y. There we go. Now, I'm going to show you what's happening with this, and the way I'm going to do that is, uh, what's the best way of doing that? 
Okay, so I'm going to have a mouse event. So a uh, mouse has clicked on an object. Left button single click. So when the mouse clicks on that object, and I'm going to use uh, global values. So set global value to the alterable value of X. Uh, I'll just pick A for now. And then I'm just going to press Ctrl and C and Ctrl and V, and that will copy that event I've just created. Um, but this time I want alterable value B to be the value of Y for the tile. So if I run this now, now I've said I can use this tool here to debug, and again, <laughs> whenever I shake it, it seems to minimize it. And I go down to global values. Can I go down to global values? Well, it doesn't seem to be working. Oh, I can't seem to load global values. Let's try it again. Now I think this is one of the few things uh, with Windows 10, unfortunately. Windows 10 um, has a few effects, not many, but a few effects on click team that I can't do that. So I'm going to just create a string object. I'm going to output it on the frame. So I'm create a string object, which is just a text object. Change the color of it to white. And drag it out a bit. And instead of doing that, I'm just going to create a string. So change alterable string. And now I want to output the number, so value x and then value y, and you'll see that this won't work, but it's a great opportunity to discuss another thing about programming languages and click team fusion. The alterable value on the object, attached to the object, is a number. Some programming languages do not care if you just put that as a string. A string is just text. But most programming languages do care. And Click Team Fusion is built on programming languages that do care. So I can't output the value of that. Okay? It's impossible to output a value in a string, a number in a string, a number as text, unless you convert it first. And that's what these are here for. So I want to convert it to a string and I want to cut that and I want to convert that to a string uh, string paste and I put a plus between them because it's called string concatenation just putting two things together and I want to put a little dash in between them so I can tell them apart the way you input strings in click to infusion is with the little quotation marks I will go into strings a lot more in a later video where we look at more applications rather than um, games, but that's a little bit of a, 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 <laughs> a bit of a um, introduction maybe. Okay, so let's run this now. And at the moment, I have not clicked any, so it just says the default um, multiple string, which is just text. But let's click on this top left one, and it says zero zero, one zero, two zero, three zero. So it's three. 0, 1, 2, 3, and it's, uh, so it's 3 across effectively and 0 down. This one here, 5, 3, and you can have, just keep doing it, and it absolutely works fine. Okay, so we know that the alterable values are working, but you could see that even though those objects, those actives, are identical, they're exactly the same, we've attached just a little bit of different data to each one. Now, it's. <sighs> The way in which we could have done this is created 24 different objects and that would have worked fine but it would have been slow and click to infusion would have had to go to 26 different bits of memory to, to create each of those objects. Click to infusion now is just picking one object, it's just creating one object and there's only ever one object but it's just using it multiple times and it goes back to what we discussed before. This is a lot less code because I've not had to manipulate my code for 26 different objects which is a pain and there's slight ways of doing that uh, by grouping the objects together but it is still a pain with this 
I've just done it once and what it's five lines of code and it's created the frame for us so it's a lot easier it's a lot quicker and it's a lot better practice but there are massive other benefits as well which we'll maybe discuss in later videos about just creating one object and using it multiple times but I can now get to an object even though there's 24 same objects I can say well actually I want this one by using those alterable values so I can say I want the one with the alterable value of uh, x as 1 and the alterable value of y as 3 for instance okay so we haven't got much of a game yet um, so we want to light up 3 in a random order so 1 2 3 and that's what we're going to be doing now okay so what we want to do is have some counter as well in the alterable value of the square to say you're the first one, you're the second one, you're the third one that I want to light up. So as well as creating an alterable value of x and a y, I want to create an alterable value of a that says what position it is, if any, in the sequence that I want to do. So what I need to do first, before I start the create x and create tar uh, y loops, I want to have another process happen. So what I'm going to do is click and drag this to the bottom to create a new empty event and move it above uh, the creating of the tiles. And I want some randomizer to create a random to have a random tile um, that's going to light up. Um, thinking about it, do I want that to happen? Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, so I need to have another loop that decides uh, which ones are going to light up. So let's have a think about this. As I said, I don't plan any of this um, as uh, before I start. So let's have a think. Uh, I need some of these to be uh, one, two, and three in the sequence. So if I have something that says you're going to be the first one and you're going to be the second one in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that and I'm going to start a different loop uh, <laughs> this is where it gets really complicated um, hmm. right so <laughs> um, I need something that says which one's going to be the first, second, or third, and it creates them each time that the user or that one is created, it fires again. So I'm going to create a loop called pick random tile, and I'm going to have the global value of A be a random number. So to do that, I click special and go to random number within a uh, random number. Sorry, generate a random number. Now, uh, thinking about it, how many x do I have? I have six, so I'm going to say random six. When I do random six, it's either going to pick zero, one, two, three, four, or five. You might think it will pick six as well. It doesn't because it's six integers, six whole numbers. It's going to pick at random. And because we start at zero for most of click to infusion, the first number is zero, so there's six of them there. And that's what I want, so it's random six, I just delete it too much. And I'm gonna have global value, so global value of B to a random and this is gonna be the Y, so random number and it's going to be six uh four because there's either 0, 1, 2, or 3 on the Y uh, axis. So on the loop, random pick, uh, pick random tile, it knows which tile it wants. So it knows which tile it wants, so I'm going to drag that to copy it, and I want it to identify which tile that corresponds to. So I'm going to insert another um, condition, right-click, so alterable value, and compared to one of the alterable values and it want, I want the x to be the global value of a 
And I want to do the same with the y equal to the global value of b. And the way of doing that is just click and drag this into the number and it just copies it. Now I can double click that and change that to y and change that to b. So when this event fires, it looks through all of the objects, all the tiles, and it finds the one which has the one we picked, which is a random one uh, for the X and a random one for the Y. But it only picks one. And what I want to do is I want the direction of that to face upwards. Uh, no, do I want the direction? No, I don't. Hang on. I don't want to do that just yet. We'll go on to that in a second. What I want to do is to create the alterable value of that, of A, to 1. Okay, so it knows that that's, in fact, do I want to do that? No, I don't. I want the alterable value to be the fast loop of, have I put face there? No, I haven't. So I want the fast loop to be pick random tile and make sure that this is the same, which is why I've always tried to copy and paste this. So looking at that, that's exactly the same. But all the rest of them will have alterable value of a zero, so I don't want zero to exist. So I'm gonna add one to that so that it can't be zero because you know that, as we know, that the loop starts at zero. So I'm gonna add one to it, so it's gonna start at one. So the first one's gonna be one and then two and then three. Now, the amount of times that I want to do the pick random tile loop is going to be dependent on the difficulty. If I do it three times, there's going to be three tiles that will appear at random. Uh, if I do it, if the game is later on and it's gone up to 10, then I want to do pick random tile 10 times. So I've got to decide when pick random tile occurs. So I'm going to do it at the start of the frame initially and I'm gonna start, and I'm just gonna copy and paste, copy this. So I'm gonna say fast loop, start random loop, I'll start a loop, pick random tile, and I'm gonna do it three times. So it's gonna go through this loop three times. It's gonna pick three random tiles and assign one to the first one, two to the second one, three to the third one. And I'm going to click to dra drag start a frame again. Now, because I don't want them all to appear at once, I want them to appear in sequence, I need some sort of timer. And the way I can do that is include a counter in the in the frame. So I'm going to go to counter. And all a counter is is just a number. The problem is the numbers are black, and there's no way of changing them easily. So what I might need to do is have a bit of a background uh, and I'm going to do quick backdrop, which just gives me a block of colour, which means I can see the counter nice at the bottom. It doesn't matter if there's a bit outside of frame. Sometimes in some of the exporters, like Flash, there is a way of uh, zooming out and seeing the stuff that you've hit, uh, hidden outside of frame. Uh, so be careful when you do that, uh, especially if the things you're hiding out of frame are important uh, to the mystery of the game. Okay. So uh, now we've got a counter, what I want to happen is that counter to keep uh, going, to count, <laughs> so it's going to become a timer. So what I can do is right click on timer and say every one second I want to add one to the counter, so add to counter one. And if I run that now, you can see that every second that counter goes up by one. Okay, so we're starting to, to get this game together, as I said. Uh, I don't start any of these knowing uh, how I'm going to do this. And the ways I've done this potentially are a little bit different to the way I would do it if I wasn't recording this. Um, I've tried to avoid any object or any uh, strategy which I don't want to introduce for this video. I'm looking just at loops and alterable values. Um, so um, a way of doing this might be with arrays, uh, which I didn't want to cover. Arrays is a big topic that needs to be done uh, in a separate video, so I've sort of tried to do this without without doing anything uh, anything too advanced uh, or anything too different to loops and alterable values. So we've got a counter ticking. So we've got the account uh, the counter ticking, and what I could say actually instead of doing that, I could replace that with when the counter is something. So when the counter is three, 
and so when the count is three I want to hmm, what do I want to do when the count is three I want to start a loop uh, do I want to start a loop um, hmm. so when the counter is three so every one second I want a different tile to appear and the tile I want to appear will be equal to the counter so in the first second the counter will be 1 so I want the uh, tile with the ultra value A of 1 to appear and then the second second the uh, counter will be 2 so instead of uh, doing it the way I was going to do I could use this again Uh, this time it's the ultra value of A that I'm interested in. If I don't, uh, so uh, A equals the counter, so current value. I don't need that one. So this event's going to fire when the counter gets to the number that is attached to the um, tile in the ultra value A. So the ultra value A was created in this loop here which picks a tile, puts it as 1, picks another tile, picks it as 2, then picks another tile, and then puts ultra value A as 3. So there's three tiles out there with three different numbers. And this event here says, well, hang on, if you've got the number which is attached to the counter here, I want you to do something. And this goes back to what I was starting earlier. If I go back to the frame editor, and I position this going upwards, and this time I'm going to have a yellow strip, the yellow background with maybe green stripes. I can choose the one I'm interested in by switching the position upwards. So if I go here and I go, right, when you're the one I want, I want your direction, select direction, I want your direction to point upwards. Okay and I can copy and paste that and say well hang on if you're not the one I want so if you're different to that if you're not the one I want I want you to face this way okay let's see if this works ah disaster at the start and then perfect there now I did predict that happening why did that happen why did they all light up at the start almost lit up at the start because naturally all alterable values start at zero every alterable value for everything is zero at the start they don't not exist they are zero in some programming languages they don't exist if you ask for them the compiler or whatever says no they don't exist you can't ask for them but click in fusion with alterable values they all exist at the start they're all there and they're all zero so when the timer is zero when this counter here is zero all of them, apart from the ones that we picked, will light up. So all I need to do is right click here, insert and say, well, okay, but right, don't don't work when it's not zero. Let's run that again. Perfect. And none of them are four, none of them are five, none of them are six, so none of them will light up. And you could create a bit of programming that stops the counter when it gets to that point, but there's no need. Um, we might do it later, who knows? We might need to do it later. Okay, so we've got three random ones being picked and three random ones being lit up. But we need to have some way of deciding um, where the user can start picking them. So at the moment, we don't want the user to pick them uh, at the start. They're lighting up, the user just observes. So we don't want anything to allow the user to start clicking them on them early or clicking on them as they light up and guessing them correctly. So let's have a think. Um, I'm going to show you something first. Uh, I'm going to click uh, on these. And I've used um, global values before. Global values, alterable values, but for the whole um, game, and they work in the whole game. Uh, so if you've got player lives or things you want to happen for the whole game, then, then those are fantastic ways of 
storing that information. It's really important as well to try and name them because they happen in the whole game. Alterable value uh, A, for instance, so if I click on new, global value, sorry, of A is not going to help you realize that you've used it before, what it's for, where it is in the code. Now I've used that to pick a random, so a random X, I'm going to call that random X. New random Y. Now I don't like starting on a capital letter, so I'll do lowercase on these. If I can, there we are. All right, so if I'm doing level 32 and I need a global value, I know not to use these two because these are already used previously, unless I'm, I know that I don't need them for level 32. Okay, so that's done. Um, and I need a new global value. Let's have a think about the best way of doing this. So I need some way for the user to click. So what I want to do is say current uh, current tile progress I don't know, I'm really bad at naming things I want a counter a global counter to say where the users up to in um, in the game so are they still on the first tile are they on the second tile are they on the third tile that's gonna start at zero and at zero, I don't want anything to happen. I want the user just to observe what's happening on the screen, observe the things lighting up. And then it's going to move to one, and that's when the users can start interacting. So, uh, let's have a think. So, uh, so the mouse, I'm going to need a, a thing saying that if they click on an object and click on the tile. So, user clicks left button on the tile. But I said that I didn't want anything to happen, so insert didn't want anything to happen if they're still observing the things come up Oop, click the wrong one so insert global value of and you can see here that they're named as I named them on the left hand side current tile progress so I want it to be different to zero if it's zero they're still observing they can't click on anything okay so at this point uh, the user, so it's switched it to one, which I'm going to program in a second, and the user can start guessing which tiles are um, in the pattern. Now, what I need to do is have a conditional here to say, well, okay, is the alterable value A equal to the alterable value of current tile progress? Current tile progress will start at 1, so the user has to pick the tile with the alterable value A of 1. And then, if that is, we can say, well, okay, let's destroy that one that they've picked. And we need to shift, so add to, current tile progress, add 1 to it. So if they successfully pick the correct first one, then it shifts it onto two and it destroys the tile. Let's have a look how that works. So that's the first one there. And I click on it, nothing happens. Why has nothing happened? Because I haven't done that bit of programming to move the current tile progress on to one. Okay, so uh, every one second. So where's the best position for me to move it onto one? Where can I guarantee that there aren't any more? Well, let's have a think. Uh, so I need an event that only happens once because if it keeps happening, it will stick current tile progress onto one. Whatever happens, it will just keep it at one. So I need something to happen just once. Uh, so what I can say is if the if the counter here is greater or equal uh, sorry is greater than three which is how, how many times we have tiles uh, actually it's greater than three so yeah so when it's zero nothing happens when it's one, the first tile lights up. When it's two, the second tile lights up. When it's three, the third tile lights up. When it's four, 
it just carried on counting. It didn't do anything because there's no um, tile with alterable value of A as 4 or 5 or 6 or anything else. So when it's greater than that, uh, I need the global value of current tile progress to equal 1. And then what I want to do is I want to stop that counter counting and make it less than 3. So what I can do is I can set the counter to minus 1 and I can put a condition on this counting that it is greater or equal to 0. So it's only going to count if it's 0 or more. And so it will count from 0, 1, 2, 3. As soon as it hits 4 it will set the counter to negative 1 and it won't continue counting. So let's have a look now. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And there we go. The game. Whew. Thought I'd never get there. Okay, so we've got a sort of rudimentary game at the moment. But there's nothing happens if you're wrong. So let's try this again. So 1, 2, 3, 1. I can just keep clicking until I find it. And there's nothing happens when I actually finish it off. So there's two things we need to do. We need to say, if you're wrong, that's it. Game over. And we could have a screen that has lives and stuff. I'm just going to close the application. You lose. I'm quite harsh like that. So I can use the same event as I used earlier to check that they were right, which is this one. And I can copy this. Control and C, then Control and V, or you could use the edit uh, at the top. And I'm going to double click the event uh, that says that it's equal to it. And I'm going to say, well, what if it's different? What if the one they're picking isn't the correct one? And I'm not going to add one to tile progress. I'm not going to destroy it. I'm going to close the application. So it's the third one along. End the application. Let's try it. So run the application. One, two, three. Get the first one. Oh, that's unusual. Let's try that again. So it might be a bit of coding problem here. Right. So what's happened? So uh, current algebra value of a is not equal to current tile progress. Ah. Now what's happened here is something that happens to me quite a lot of the time, unfortunately, and hopefully others. Uh, the thing that happens here will occur first in code. It will check that the player has picked the right one. And I did pick the right one, but what's happened is after this event is fired, it's fired this event. Now, the first one has alterable value A of one. And I start off when I can play the game as one. Uh, my uh, global value is one. And when that first event fires, that's perfect. Yeah, destroys it, perfect. But then it goes to the second event, and the first event has moved this on to two. And at the second event, actually, one's not equal to two, so it's different, and it's closed the application down. Now, a way around this is I can check that it's wrong before it's right, and I just click and drag that up. So I can check it's wrong first, and then check it's right. So let's run this, run application. So one, two, three, one, two, and then let's get this wrong, three. And that's the way around it. A better way is to create maybe a loop with that. And the one that they've clicked on can be checked in that loop um, or create a group or, or structure it slightly different. There are ways better than just reorganizing them, but that works. So let's stick with that. And sometimes with clicked infusion, if something works, you stick with it, and then maybe later on try and think of different and better ways of doing it. Okay, so we've got that bit done. We also need uh, a way of them knowing that it's correct, uh, or that they've finished the sequence, some reward or, or some description. And I can use the text box uh, at the bottom to say something like, you've won. And all I'd need to do here is to create a new condition and say, uh, compared to global value, current tile progress, well, if it's equal, or if it's, sorry, if it's greater than three, let's just stick with that, 
if it's greater than three, then the alterable value at the bottom could say something like you win, you win. There we are. And I need to destroy the event earlier where I've used the string object. And that was used just for debugging. So run application. One, two, three. One, two, three. And it says you win. Woo! Have I clicked a different one? Well, close the application down. So I want to get rid of that. And so I'm only going to allow that one to fire if this is lower or equal to three. So that the player at the end can't then lose. So they've got them all right. And there we are. Wherever I click, it won't happen. All right, so we also want to uh, have a sort of a different level at the end. So might change up to well done. All right, uh, so I need some way of um, letting the person tap, uh, pat themselves on the back that they've won, but also um, start a different level, start with four and then five and then six. So I need some sort of timer to count the, yes, the well done screen's on and let's start again. So I need to create a different timer. So if I right click this and click clone, because I want a brand new timer, All right, brand new counter. Let's put this one down here. And these don't need to be on screen when you start doing the application, but it's useful to have them on screen so we can check what value they are throughout the application. And so when this is true, I want to set this counter to one. And then if that value, if that counter is greater than zero, I want, and I can use this, I'm just copy this down here. Every one second, I wanted to add one to the counter. And then if the counter is greater or equal to, I don't know, four, then I want to start the, the whole process again. Now, one way we could do this game is have the whole thing start again when it's when it's restarting. So draw all the tiles again, start the whole thing again. And the, you don't need to do that. You could just go through each of the tiles and wipe their alterable value A's. And that would be a way of doing it. Sometimes it's a lot easier just to get rid of everything and start it again at the start of each level or at the start of each stage uh, in the game. And I'm going to do that for this one. Now I'm going to destroy, and this says destroy the tile, but actually it's going to destroy all of them because I've not indicated anywhere here that I'm picking a specific tile. So it's going to wipe all the tiles on the screen. So let's see that in action. So one, two, three, one, two, three three and then this counter ah and you can see I've got the same thing the problem with this is uh, what is the problem with this the current tile progress is greater than three is setting this counter to one continuously so I right right click that and insert and I only want that to happen once for every loop so anytime the current tile progress is greater than three that thing will happen once and then won't happen again and then if it goes below three and then above three again then it'll happen just once so let's run that one two three one two three this start to count and then all of them get wiped okay but it would be a bit of a boring game if all of them got wiped and that was that so we want the thing to start again and the thing that started at the start was this one here, so I'm going to copy and paste the event down here. What else do we have at the start of the frame? We pick random tile. So I'm going to click on that, pick random tile. And what else do we have? I think that's it. So let's try that. So run application. So it's counting. So I have the well done message. Ah, and then this weird thing happens. Now, the problem with restarting is sometimes you miss something. And the thing I missed quite clearly was the global variables. I need to reset them. And you just got to remember to do it. If you want to do it this way of wiping everything and starting again, 
uh, each stage of the level you've got to remember to wipe everything so simple fix is just set the alterable values well the random X and the random Y will set themselves the current tile progress is the one we want to reset okay let's try it again one two Ooh, that was weird I think what happened was it was the same tile that lit up there so let's have a look, three, four, five and still the same thing, let's have a think uh, so there's obviously add uh, these counters here <laughs> set counters to zero, set counters to zero and we want to make sure that the loops happen at the end when everything is reset okay let's try it again one two three one two three let's hopefully this will work one two three one oh now that means there's something else that hasn't been reset so let's check my global variables but these two don't matter because they get reset anyway that one's done uh, all of those are destroyed I've set the two counters um, okay so we've got a real problem here if I run the application sometimes three don't show up uh, so if I click that one that one that one and also the second level is impossible even if you get the right answer which I'm over now it closes down the application you are gonna find yourself in this position loads of times get used to it your game your application is not going to work first time there are going to be problems and part of the point of me doing it without planning it in advance is because I want you to see some of the problems that can happen now one of these was intentional and I knew about it when it happened the other one was completely unintentional and I can show you the answer to both of them I have an idea of what's going on so the first thing is that yes it's picking one at random and it's working almost as we want it the problem is what if it picks the same square well what's going to happen is it's going to pick a tile to be number one which is fine another tile to be number two but if it picks that same tile to be number three then it completely wipes out the fact that that was number two and it's now number three and the player doesn't have any chance of picking the right one also when we go through the sequence it's no longer a number two it's a number three tile so it goes to one and that lights up but there isn't a number two so it just leaves it blank none of them have an alterable value of a as two and then it goes to the third one as, as usual so that's a problem and we need to fix that the second thing I believe what's happening looking at the only event that ends the application you can see that this ignoring the rest of it this is the key bit here alterable value a is different to current tile progress well the one that we are clicking on in the second level that does that shouldn't happen the only way that is happening is if well I'll let you have a little bit guess about why that is because I can show you a way of finding out what the problem is with that okay so let's sort that one out first because that's that's stopping us from going to later levels straight away the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use that string at the bottom so I'm going to just temporarily delete that and a way of doing that is if you right click and go to never you can drag some stuff you want to store because I still want it to say well done but I just don't want it to at the moment and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say always set that string and I'm going to change alterable string and I want it to be a, I want it to convert a number to a string so I'm going to click string and I want it to tell me how many tiles there are if I click run so there's 24 tiles which is what we'd expect and you click this one then this one then this one 21 that's what we'd expect okay next level and now there's 43 now 43 is too many 
it means basically they're not deleting. These tiles uh, from level one are still there, which means when we pick the right answer, we're not clicking on, well, we're clicking on R1, but we're also clicking on the one that is from level one, which is going to make us fail the game. So what I need to do is go to the bit of code that deleted it, and I can delete that now, and I can move this one back. Where was this one? Uh, I think it was there. Or if I just press Control and Z, I can just undo. Ah, there we are. It was supposed to be there. Okay, and let's delete the never. All right, so let's have a look at the code. This should be destroying all our tiles. If you look at it, it should work, but it doesn't. There's no point in uh, worrying ourselves about it. It's not working. There are two things I could do. What I could do is drag this down, create a new event, and give it its own event, give it its own row, and say, right, click to infusion, you need to do this. Uh, even though click to infusion has a hierarchy of events it needs to do, sometimes it can get confused about what you mean by delete. What we mean is delete all of them, delete all the tiles. But in a large event, it might think, oh, maybe that's not what you want. So if you have it on its own line, it's saying, yeah, you have to delete it. Second thing you can do is if I insert into this and I say anyone that has an alterable value, uh, alterable value Z of zero, which is all of them, because I've not interfered with the uh, alterable value of Z, then destroy. Now that forces click to infusion to go through every single tile and delete it, and it forces it into an action. Now I don't think we need to have that, so I'm going to try it without, because it could be that later on I decide that I need Z for something, and let's run it and let's see if it works. So hopefully this will work. Okay, one, one, two three all looking good so far so one two and let's make this a wrong one and that works okay so that's that's that sorted now let's have a look at the random tile section so uh, what I need to do now this this gets really complicated what's happening is what I need it to do is remember which ones it's already picked and make sure that it doesn't pick them again. The way you could do that, which I don't want to do, is store the information and then get it to look up. There's no way of doing that without introducing um, arrays or um, without introducing maybe even a list object or some sort of file store, uh, which I do not want to get into for this. So I'm going to do a little bit of a different method. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get it to check if the alterable value A of the tile which it's talking about uh, is zero. And if it is, fine. If it's not, I want it to loop back again. That's not the best system because that can mean in the game that it's constantly picking ones it's already picked before and it can make it very slow at the start. But for a game like this, it shouldn't cause much of a problem. So let's see how I can do that. Um, so this is the bit here where it assigns the random numbers and then this is the bit here which it decides to act on those numbers. So what I want to do is I want to copy and paste this row and delete that action and I want it to start a new fast loop and I'm going to call this uh, assign um, alt a. I don't know, I'll sign all day, why not? I'm going to get it to fire once. And this is now going to be in the assign alt a, because we're assigning the alter alterable value a onto the tile. And what I need is to do is copy and paste this. So I've clicked on that and press control C and then control V. You can go to edit as well. And I need some sort of conditional to check that it is actually going to work. And the way I do that, is insert and I'm going to just compare two general um, values and I'm going to look into um, the uh, uh, actually no there's a better way of doing this let's insert 
And I'm going to look at the tile and see if the alterable value of A is equal to zero. And that will mean that it picks, because of the way the order I've put these, it finds the one that has the X value of the random X, the Y value of the random Y, and it checks to see if it's not currently being used, which it's not. Then I'm just going to drag and copy this into this one and say, well, what if it's not zero? If it's different to zero. Well, what happens then? Well, we don't want to set it to a new value. What we actually want to do is we want to just start the, start the loop again. Now, you can see that if it keeps picking, which it could do, if it keeps picking the same one, say it keeps picking zero, zero, then it will go in there, it will go, no, 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 you, you, we can't pick that one, try it again. And then if it picks zero, zero again, it's just going to keep going. But the problem with this loop as we're at the moment is we have got ourselves in a situation where it's going to keep having the same number. So we need to also put this one here into this uh, Alt A. So let's have a look how we can do that. If I swap these over and I move this, okay. So for the uh, pick random tile, it'll fire that and it will start assigning Alt A. It will pick the two random numbers, see if they work. If they don't, it won't start pick random tile again. It will just start uh, the assign Alt A and it will keep just doing that little loop before it moves on to the next loop. Let's see if it works. Hopefully. Oh, it does not like that. So <laughs> when it crashes. Now, what you used to have on the very old um, click and play, uh, etc., is when you made a mistake and you tried the application, the whole program would, would die. With Click Team Fusion, the thing you view it on, um, what do they call it, they'll just run application, is stored differently to the actual program. So when one crashes, the other typically doesn't crash, which is a massive improvement. Okay, so I've got a bit of a logic problem here. Um, looking at that, it seems that I've got the same problem as I had before. It's an endless loop that will constantly change. And it, yeah, okay. So that's just going to keep doing the same thing. So if I drag this on top, um, let's see if this works. There we are. One, two, three. So I've made the same mistake twice. It's not very good. Now the problem with this is you're going to have to do it a lot of times before you see whether it worked. But already this is starting to look good. And we haven't had any repeat at all so far, so that's really good. Now, as the, as the game goes, this is quite boring because it's not getting any more challenging. It's just three each time. So now we're going to finish this game off by allowing it to um, get harder. So let's close that down. It's quite addictive, actually. Now, I've tried to... As I've gone along to code this, that this next step, the difficulty level, can easily be um, um, made. What I'm going to do to start is I'm going to have a global value and I'm just going to call it difficulty. If I've spelled that right, which I haven't. Difficult. That does look wrong. Anyway, let's leave it for now. Difficulty I want to start off with is three. Now, what's helpful to do is store every number that you're likely to change as a variable straight away. And don't use real numbers unless you're convinced that they are going to remain constant. So, I've stored that as difficulty, but I have hard-coded this 3 here, which I don't want it to be a 3 anymore. I want it to be the global value of difficulty. And there are other places I've done that so let's have a look through the code where I've done that okay that all looks fine there was one other place and I think it's this bit here current tile progress well that's not necessarily three anymore that's just difficulty uh, is this yeah I think this has to be greater than difficulty and 
this has to be greater than uh, is this right no that's just the timer so that's fine okay let's try that now uh, let's let's add one to it at this stage so I also want to add one to difficulty so global value add to difficulty and add one to it let's see if that works hopefully it will one two three one two three well done we need to sort that out so it needs to go away and now there's a mystery fourth one. Oh, it's remaining at three why is that working? why is that happening? so I've obviously changed the wrong thing somewhere one two three so let's have a look at the global values difficulty is six yet it's only doing it three times so let's have a look uh, so that's fine difficulty current tile progress I think needs to be greater than global value of difficulty and let's see um, did I I didn't see them enough so that's all fine so there's clearly something that is not quite working uh, ah it's because I've updated it here but not updated at the bottom uh, so okay and then copy that's what the problem is so instead of three times we're going to do that difficulty times let's run that again one two three one two three one two three four yay one two three four and it works now I'm gonna stop it there because this uh, video has been going on for a while um, thank you very much for your comments and your thumbs up I really appreciate it um, this has been a lot of fun to do um, and I'm looking forward to uh, trying out different types of applications as well as games um, if you've enjoyed this video please subscribe and please keep the thumbs up going and I have weird thumbs. Anyway, thank you.